Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tila Troj, and I am the director of the Shinnecock Kelp Farmers. We are located on the east end of Long Island in New York, where six intergenerational indigenous women uh, from the Shinnecock Nation were all enrolled tribal members. And we are on a mission to restore the bay that has sustained us as people since time immemorial. Uh, the place that we live is a glacial deposit. And for just tens of thousands of years, we were able to survive on the abundance of the sea and the marine life that, that surrounded us. And I'll take you on a virtual tour of our hatchery um, in just a moment. But before I do that, I just want to lay out the landscape a little bit. So, we, so our tribal nation is what's known as a first contact nation. And so we had our first um, experience with European colonists in 1640. When we first encountered these settlers, they were very cold. It was December. They were very hungry. They didn't have any food. And they were they were pretty sick, and so um, we felt very bad for them, and we helped them, and we showed them how we use seaweed to insulate our homes to keep warm, and we showed them how we use seaweed to fertilize our plants and grow corn. And we specifically taught them our three sisters method of farming, which was a way that we were able to sustain very large pop populations of people um, in addition to the abundance of our bay. Since that time, um, our neighbors are now known um, as a town of Southampton. It's home to some of the wealthiest people in the entire world, some of the most powerful people. There's no shortage of resources or, or money that, that's available generally in this region. Um, and with that in mind, since 1640, they never, um, they never built wastewater treatment centers, they never built sewers, and they never built septic systems. And after COVID-19, there was a mass exodus of these like very wealthy people from New York City to the east end of our Long, of our Long Island. And they, they decimated our entire food source. Um, the Biden-Harris administration just declared our bay a national fisheries disaster zone due to the fact that there is a 99.99% die off of um, sea scallops. And there's other mass die-offs. And, so, um, and so as women of our nation wanting to protect our way of life and our traditions um, and our food sources, we, we, we started on this mission to grow sugar kelp. And so I'm going to share my screen so that I can take you on a virtual tour um, of our hatchery. So we have a, um, a hatchery. It's located on um, it's located on a site that's currently owned by a group called the Sisters of St. Joseph. They are Catholic nuns and they have a retreat center. And we became acquainted with them actually through uh, a number of different um, issues and, and problems that arose. Um, and, um, and we became really, really just um, aligned in values. And so um, one of the first things that these sisters did with us was they shared our land ethic, which we, we felt really resonated with us as the women um, water protectors and land defenders of our territorial home. And so, um, and so in 2019, there was a film that came out and I, I strongly recommend um, everyone to, to watch it. I think you can rent it on um, online. It's called Conscious Point and it stars one of our co-founders of the Shinnecock Kelp Farmers, Rebecca Genia and her pursuit to stop overdevelopment 
um, of our region, which which is the cause of of these like mass marine die offs. And and um, and so that film came out. It was on um, PBS nationwide during uh, Thanksgiving or Native American History Month. And so we gained a lot of attention and a group called Green Wave approached us and asked us if we would have any interest in um, in seaweed farming. And so and so this idea was brought to me and I said, yes, I, I definitely have an interest and my interest is rooted um, in the work that I do. Um, I'm an attorney for my nation, the Shinnecock Nation. And even though we were a first contact tribe, uh, we're we're what's known as a recently federally recognized tribe, and that that's because we had to basically sue the United States for over 32 years to prove that we were the original <laughs> occupants of this land that we have never left and have always been stewards of and called home. And so we were able to do that um, through court documents, a set of court documents that are called the seaweed cases. And the seaweed cases were just a group of um, a group of court documents that recognized our rights to the water and to fishing and to hunting and to collecting and to gathering, um, and specifically our right to lease out seaweed lots to those who are engaged in aquaculture. And I know on the West Coast it's a little bit more familiar um, than on the East Coast. Um, but, you know, this was a very strong um, source of proof that the United States government upheld as recognizing our sovereignty, our inherent sovereignty to the water around our territory. And now, um, and, and now, you know, we're facing a, a really steep decline in water quality. And so, um, and so that was the catalyst for this hatchery that we built together with the Sisters of St. Joseph. And none of us are scientists. Like I said, I'm an attorney. Um, one of the other farmers is um, a great, great, great grandmother. Another is a psychologist. Another works in human resources. Like none of us are scientists, but every single element of this hatchery that we built um, in the, in the, one of the vacation cabin rooms of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Um, it's manageable, it's scalable, and it's something that, that we can do. We found out we were really good at it. Um, one, of, one of the, I think, um, things that I'm most proud of is a program that we call um, Kind Words. And it's where, we speak kind words and we invite others, especially children and young girls and the sisters and others to come into our hatchery as our seeds are still in the microscopic phase shortly before they get to this phase um, and wish them well in the work that they're about to do to restore the bay and to recreate habitat for the marine life that so desperately needs it because our water is so, it's so um, polluted by nitrates and just overwhelming amount of nitrogen that is completely starving all of the marine life of oxygen. And so, um, and so one of the most incredible, like most observable thing that we saw with our farm is this like incredible increase in the biodiversity. And it's everything from like shorebirds, to the scallops, to seahorses, sharks. Um, we had just an incredible range of species that just thrived in, in our kelp farms. And so um, a lot of that, a lot of that, I think success was due to this kind words program. We also like sang to our seedlings while they were in the hatchery. We sang uh, traditional Algonquian songs to them. And we read them Joy Harjo's poetry. 
And we carefully controlled like every element of their environment from the lighting to the water temperature. And we constantly, constantly um, replenished their water, which is actually water that we got directly from the sea um, and constantly. <laughs> we're replenishing, which is, which is, it was a lot of work. You see the buckets in the background of this picture. We would literally um, haul the water like in these buckets. Um, we've since gotten permits. This is a very temporary setup that was in uh, one of the living rooms, again, of the cabins of the retreat center, but we just got permits from the town to build a more permanent facility. This is um, Sister Karen. She's one of, she's on the leadership of this, of the Sisters of St. Joseph, helping us to add some nutrients to the hatchery. And they, they are in this environment, this very like controlled nurturing environment um, from anywhere to like six to eight weeks. And these seeds end up all up and down the East Coast from, uh, from just about, um, the Cape Cod area of Massachusetts, all the way down to Long Island. Uh, we, we have about six different farms that these seedlings end up on. And we have additional farms from um, Montauk Point all the way to Jamaica Bay that, that test, our, um, test our seeds to see uh, the best areas where the kelp grows in our region, because, uh, you know, we're here in the Northeast Atlantic, we're experiencing um, very high sea temperatures. And so we're not sure what's going to happen like this upcoming hatchery season, because the last three seasons, it's been really hard for us to dive for the source tissue because the kelp just isn't adapted to live in such warm temperatures. So we're hoping that with this new permanent facility that we're um, building, that perhaps we could be less dependent on wild diving and, and more dependent on gametophytes. And so the technology I think is um, coming to make that possible and to make this like more sustainable. Um, because, you know, in addition to all the excess carbon in our water, um, the, the nitrates, they're just really, really becoming um, very hazardous. And the, 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 the county is kind of stuck on upgrading its septic systems. There's all kinds of like political tensions. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is raise awareness and educate and partner and um, become allies with as many different like-minded groups as we can <laughs> so that we can like have a wide scale um, effort to, to protect the Bay. And, um, you know, for us as Shinnecock people, we were raised to always, um, always appreciate our source of food, which for us, again, was the Bay. Um, and, and it's really, it's, it's shocking to us when we engage with our neighbors who, again, are these very, very wealthy, um, basically billionaires um, who live across from us and, um, you know, are the primary sources of not only the nitrate pollution, but also the excess greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that all of us um, then suffer the effects of. This is a picture of our, our Shinnecock Bay. This is like our primary farm site. And right across, you can see on the other side of the water, is it's an area called Billionaire's Row. And it's basically this just really small barrier island where homes like regularly sell for like $100, $175 million or, or more. Um, and so those are our neighbors. And, um, and so, it's, it's the six of us women plus our partners, but we're trying to really um, educate as many people and also model like different ways, like alternatives to, to, to the capitalism that has gotten us to this place. We really think that 
there's opportunities, economic opportunities to pay people living wages, to work in jobs where you can take care of the environment and also afford to raise a family. And so that's one of the things that we're also doing in our education is show, trying to show other, other models um, because we're because we've been the victims of exploitation and enslavement and indentured servitude for so long like we've had all of our resources stripped from us all of our land stolen and um and now all of our food sources stolen too and so um and so we're out there this is uh this is our farmer donna um and you can see it's very, very cold. So, so I know everyone on here probably is a kelp enthusiast, but for us, like we're out in um, December, January, it gets really, really cold, February, March. Um, and it, it does, it, it's, it's really, um, we all are so dedicated to it. It's, um, it's something that we feel compelled to do to help our mother earth. Um, and it's um, it's really our honor to be able to do it and to share it with others and to um, even just be on this call and sharing with all of you guys um, and connecting um, because taking action I think is so important, especially when it can be paralyzing to look at the scope of the, the problems that we're facing. Um, with the loss of habitat and the loss of marine life. And, you know, I was recently talking to a scientist and um, he was telling me, uh, we were on a call with the Sunrise Movement. He was telling me that, um, that unfortunately, we probably have to accept that this sea scallop that had the 99.99% .99 die off rate is probably going to become extinct. And it's so sad. Like, it's so. Um, sad, but we also have to face like the really real reality for us as Shinnecock people. We had so much of our land stolen that all that we're on now, all that they left us was a peninsula that's at or below sea level. And every time there's a big storm, a hurricane, or even a nor'easter um, or a superstorm, um, we risk being completely underwater. I think FEMA has updated their numbers that by 2050, they expect 75% of our territory to be underwater during a major storm. And so one of the recommendations that we had to like mitigate and adapt to this was to like surround our entire territory um, with, with sugar kelp specifically. Um, and that also would help us to uh, address a problem that we're having with ocean acidification. So one of the things that our tribe is like really well known for is creating something called wampum, which is a bead from a clamshell. It was used as like the first currency in the United States. It's really, um, it's really sacred to us, but we, we were having this problem with our wampum, the, all the wampum carvers were saying that the wampum was becoming like really brittle, really hard to carve. It wasn't polishing, the, we were losing the color in it. It used to be like this vibrant purple color. It was now mostly only white. And so, um, and so we found out that that was because of the excess carbon and all the excess greenhouse gases. And so the sugar kelp also helps us to sequester a lot of that carbon, um, which is also really important to us and what we're doing. Um, and so, um, yeah, I can't wait till, till the question and answer session. Um, but this is like our mid stage. Um, we had a really bad problem this year with some with an algae called slip gut. Um, and basically it was like coating our lines and suffocating our kelp seedlings. So it required so much hands-on maintenance this year. We had to like literally go out and shake off our lines, which let all of the slip gut um, float away. But the slip gut is also like really bad for the fluke and the flounder. Um, so we're trying to 
to work around that, but also we're trying to like put our test lines out next year into a bunch of different locations where hopefully we could avoid that because we think with the warming temperatures, we're going to have more and more problems um, doing this kind of like sh a shallow water cultivation because of all the, the other algae blooms. And we're also, um, we have other like issues going on. Um, for example, uh, they're planning to, the, the Biden-Harris administration just leased out all of the land around Long Island and a lot of the land in New England to like offshore wind. And as we are divesting off of fossil fuels and transitioning to like renewables like um, offshore wind, you know, they're predicting at least a two degree increase in the temperature on top of the other <laughs> increases in the temperature, which is going to cause like these algae blooms that um, that then suffocate like everything. So it's going to be, it's really like a, we're at a critical time to get as many people like locally who are already involved in aquaculture to do like co-culturing. Like we're really encouraging like oyster farmers, especially to, to put out kelp also with their, um, with their, with their seeds so that, you know, they can benefit from one another. Um, but this just shows you the scalability of our first farm. This is um, again on Shinnecock Bay. There's a drone shot, so you can kind of see those faint white lines are where our lines start. Um, we started with about 30. And just in that small area, again, the increase in biodiversity was incredible. One of our partners was from the, um, or is from the Nature Conservancy, and he's like an avid bird watcher. And he came to our farm one day. He has a house like also along Shinnecock Bay, but he came to our farm one day and he was so excited because he saw some bird that he said he hasn't seen in the area for in like the past like 15 years. And so, um, and so it's really, it's really something that we're, again, very proud to be a part of. Um, um, and we think it's really important. And we're, um, you know, we're always, we're always looking to adapt to new technologies. And so I know on the West Coast, shallow water kelp farming may not be as familiar, um, but here we're really trying to do it to protect our fisheries and to replenish the oxygen and um, to, to again, help give our shellfish a bit of a chance because the ocean acidification is just so terrible from those excess greenhouse gases in our region. Um, and so it's really, I don't know how many of you have, um, have been out in the water like this, but it's really like a restorative feeling, like even just to the person, to the body, like to the human body, it, like it feels like the water is like embracing you and hugging you and like knowing that you're doing this restorative work for, for um, a body of water that, you know, has been um, treated as just a dump site and not held in, in the spiritual re regard that it should have been um, by, you know, uh, the, the, those who colonized us. It's really, it's really, um, it's, it's a little bit heartbreaking, but it's also like really empowering and um, something powerful to be a part of. Um, here you can see in the back of us is an area of land. You see all those houses kind of up on the hillside. So this is an area called Shinnecock Hills. Um, and that area was stolen from us um, by the state of New York in 1859. Um, and then in the 1970s, uh, native tribes for the first time were, were allowed in the courts of the United States. So we brought suit. Um, as did a, a lot of other tribes in the Northeast to varying success. But basically uh, what the court said was that we had waited too long to bring our claim, even though the courts weren't open to us until the very year that we brought the claim. And so after that, after that um, court decision came out, all those houses popped up and they popped up so fast and so rapidly that again, they never put 
wastewater treatment, sewers, or adequate septic in them. And so, and they're at the highest point. Again, it's Shinnecock Hills. So they just run off directly into this body of water and the body of water behind it, which is the Peconic Bay. Um, and so, <laughs> and so again, and then we're on the right hand side um, on a peninsula that's sinking underwater. So it's really, um, it's really, it's really hard to do, but it's really rewarding. Um, this was um, our result of our harvest this year. Um, you can see that the kelp was very happy this year. Um, grew quite long, even though it was in an extremely shallow environment. These were grown, um, believe it or not, three foot anchors, and you could see the kelp is much longer than that. And then we turn it into a soil amendment, which we encourage um, we encourage gardeners and farmers to use uh, as a biostimulant uh, to increase the yield and productivity um, of their gardens. 